through this broadcast. And if you'd like to actually have a conversation, uh, we can, if you click the, the button that says raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you and we can have a brief conversation uh, about the question that you've got. So we'll be underway shortly. Okay, we're broadcasting everywhere we should be, so let's get underway. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the live q and I'm Terry Ryder, founder of hotspotting.com.au, and this is your opportunity to ask me your questions about residential real estate. I'll be here for the next hour or so to try to provide answers to your queries about locations or situations in real estate across Australia. Now, normally these Q&A sessions, 90% or 99% of the questions relate to location but I suspect that today might be a little different with questions about the, the virus crisis and its various impacts, whether I expect markets to drop or which locations I expect to take a hit, or the consequences of taking a mortgage holiday, whether you should be active in the market now or should you wait to see what happens. So type your questions into the, the chat box or the, the Q&A panel. I'll do my best to provide answers. And if you'd like to have a, a live conversation, click the put your hand up button and we'll be able to make that happen. It's an opportunity to make sense about what's going on at the moment. I think it's very difficult for consumers to get a grip on the reality of the situation because the coverage in mainstream media is so sensationalist and overwhelmingly negative. Anyone willing to make a doomsday prediction is likely to get far more prominence in mainstream media than the majority of commentators and analysts who are suggesting more moderate outcomes. Now, while I'm waiting, um, for some questions to come through. We've got some webinars coming up. A webinar next week is with award-winning buyer's agent and author Miriam Sankur of Property Mavens. And it'll be on Wednesday next week, the 29th of April. The topic is how to deal with your situation amid corona. And Miriam will be looking at the various situations people might find themselves in um, at the moment, landlord with a job, landlord without a job, tenant with a job, tenant without a job, investors, home buyers, and whichever category you're in, what's the best way forward in the current climate. Uh, many people are dealing with tricky situations because of the shutdown and its impact on business and employment. So to get a better understanding of how to make decisions and move forward, make sure you tune into that special webinar at lunchtime next week on Wednesday. And uh, you can we'll register for that webinar on the hotspotting.com.au website. Uh, so that's uh, next Wednesday, the 29th of April at uh, lunchtime. Australian Eastern Standard Time. The following week, on Tuesday the 5th of May, I'll be doing a special webinar featuring Peter Folds of the Tax Depreciation Specialist Washington Brown. And that topic is uh, what investors need to know about tax depreciation in a pandemic. And in a, in a few moments, I'm actually going to have a, a live hookup with Peter Folds from Washington Brown just to talk a little bit about that upcoming uh, webinar. And um, But first, uh, before we do that, in, in perhaps... Um, five or 10 minutes time. Let's, uh, we've got questions now starting to come through. So let's perhaps uh, see what people want to know about. Um, John is asking, what is your overall view on the market, short to medium term to the end of this year? Um, very broad question, John, but I understand that a lot of people are asking questions like that. Um, I, one of my um, responses to questions about the market is that we don't have a uh, situation of one market in Australia. We have many different markets. And um, even though there's this huge overriding situation at the moment with the, the virus crisis impacting uh, very broadly across Australia, there still are, I think, different situations from location to location. Some locations will be much less impacted than others. Some I expect to be have very little impact at all because of the nature of their local economy, their location, etc. But generally speaking, John, I think that uh, we are going to take a short term hit. Uh, I think it will be short term and that uh, there will be a strong recovery coming out the other side. We're already having the conversation in Australia about releasing uh, some of the restrictions. And the more that happens, the more we can start to get back to some kind of normality the more I think that um, property markets will uh, enter that recovery phase. Uh, it's worth remembering that coming in 
the situation. Real estate was very strong in Australia. In most places in Australia, markets were rising, demand was rising, supply was low, and so prices were starting to rise. We also have a situation of very low vacancies in most situations in most locations across Australia. So that gives uh, real estate a very solid underpinning coming into this situation. Um, and we know from history that during economic crises, uh, real estate does tend to hang tough, to stay solid, and, uh, and very, very often to lead Australia out of the downturn. So I'm expecting similar outcomes this time. It does depend on how long the shutdown goes on, but uh, we're already talking uh, today, yesterday, uh, at the highest levels in Australia of uh, starting to ease restrictions. So I think it's relatively short term. Um, Ganesh is asking, um, what will be the Sydney outlook? I have a house in Hornsby. What should I hold on if I want to start the sale process? What should that be? Look, um, I know there's a tendency, um, uh, the, the situation creates a lot of fear and uncertainty. And um, I think there's, um, it's very important not to make any panic decisions. Um, I don't think there's any need for people to sell uh, unless you absolutely have to for some specific reason. But if you don't need to sell, it's not the sort of market that I think that you would want to be selling. And um, there is another side to this thing. Um, and I think that the, the downturn um, is going to be relatively short term. And I think the recovery will be strong. So there's no need um, if you own property um, to, to sell it um, using the mentality, get out while the going is good. I don't think that that's the situation that we're in by any stretch of the imagination in Australia. Sydney and Melbourne, I think, will probably be more impacted in the short term than, uh, than most locations. I think a lot of locations in Australia will have very little impact, particularly regional ones. That's the biggest cities where uh, there's a lot of major wealth, which is likely to have been impacted by the share market situation, and also the other cities most affected by the shutdown of auctions. Other parts of Australia, auctions just aren't a factor. Um, across Australia, less than 10% of sales happen by auction. In some markets, no auctions happen, or very few. And so they're not impacted by that decision, but Sydney and Melbourne are. So that's um, definitely impact on the market, but I think it'll be short term. Okay. Um, Excuse me a moment, just um, what are your views about buying in regional Victoria? This is coming from Nash, areas such as Ballarat and Geelong. In times such as this, um, do you see regional Victoria being impacted as much as Melbourne? No, not as much. Um, and it very much depends on the location, the makeup of their economy. And I think that's very crucial at the moment. Like locations that are very, very strongly dependent on tourism, particularly international tourism, such as the Gold Coast, for example, will be more impacted than, say, a regional city where it's more about agriculture, viticulture, um, education. Locations like Ballarat and Bendigo have very diverse economies. Uh, for example, strong education sector, medical services is very important. Uh, there's all kinds of different things going on there. Tourism is a factor, but it's not a major factor in those economies, not as big as in some other locations. So I think those markets will be much less affected. And coming out of it, I think there's going to be a surge of demand in regional areas close to capital cities. And I think um, regional Victoria, which has been a strong market for the last couple of years, is going to do very well out of the trends, such as people being forced to work from home. And um, for some people, that will become a a permanent situation. So I think it's going to precipitate more people thinking about moving out of the cities to lifestyle locations within striking distance of the major cities. Okay. Um, there's a question here about the Mackay market. Um, it's from Al Francis, um, prediction for uh, the Mackay area, will the housing market improve? Look, I think Mackay is going to be one of those regional areas that, that will do better than most. Um, it has, and one of the reasons for that is that I think that um, one of the sectors that's remaining strong through this period is the resources sector, and Mackay has strong links to that. And I think coming out of the 
the virus shut down, I think Australia's going to have a resources boom. We're going to have another resources boom. There's going to be major demand in Australia, but also offshore, particularly from China for Australian resources. And so locations such as Mackay, which has strong links to the central Queensland mining sector, is going to get considerable benefit from that. In fact, we're already seeing in some of those central Queensland markets, I'm seeing information coming through suggesting that the leasing the rental market is very strong in locations like the Whitsundays, um, Mackay, Rockhampton. These are all central Queensland regional areas that have uh, links to the resources sector. People who work in the central Queensland resources sector um, live in locations like Mackay and Rockhampton, the Whitsundays. And there's been a rise recently through this pandemic period in demand for rentals in those areas. And I think it's coming out of the resources sector, which I think is going to get stronger as we rise out of this. And markets like Mackay, I think are going to do much better than others. Uh, now, Katie has sent me a message. She said, Michael has his hand raised. And um, okay, well, we could perhaps make that happen. Katie, if you can facilitate that, we can have a, a, have a conversation. Um, about whatever it is, the, the, the question that um, Michael would like to ask. Hi, hi Terry. Hi, Michael. How are you going? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for putting this on. Really appreciate it. That's all right. What, what would you? What's your most burning question tonight? Yeah. So I, I, I've got a, um, a a loan approval of one hundred and sixty thousand. Now it's not it's not a lot, um, and I'm looking. I was looking at places like Wodonga uh, or Wagga Wagga. Um, but I wasn't sure what would be the, the best at that sort of uh, level to, to look at. Um, now, I do have one place in Logan, uh, which I bought a few years ago, um, also based on your recommendations, around about the 190,000. Right, eh? Yeah, so as that's the situation. Okay, so um, you've got a loan approval and you're thinking sort of regional um, at that price range, yeah. that, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned Aubrey Wodonga. Um, I think it's a, a great place to consider, certainly a high level of affordability and good rental use, but also I think a very strong regional centre. Mm -hmm. we when we're thinking regional, we'll, we always look for diversity in the local economy and Aubrey Wodonga has that in spades. It's one of the, the strongest regional cities in the country. It's got lots of diversity, lots of different things going on. And I think it's one of those places that most likely to come through this uh, pandemic period strongly and it has a, a strong future it's unlikely to ever be like a boom location mm -hmm. but um i think it's going to be very solid it's a good solid safe place to own real estate and you're going to be getting good rental return so you'll have a property um that's probably going to you know pay for itself um won't be negatively geared wagga wagga also a good place i mean it's a market that's been very strong coming into this period Wagga Wagga was one of those places where demand was rising and prices were rising quite strongly. Mm -hmm. I, can, I would say similar things about Wagga that I would about Aubrey Wodonga, diversity, strong. You know, those big regional centres that um, serve a broad region um, and people come to that capital city of the region like Wagga uh, for um, education, for medical services, Wagga's got a strong military economy, Air Force base and Army base, and that um, creates a lot of traffic uh, th through Wagga for various reasons around that. Um, and so it, it's very similar um, sentiment to what I've just said about um, Albury Wodonga. Yeah. Um, another place you might consider would be the Latrobe Valley, where there are uh, a number of towns with very affordable real estate um, a strong local economy, well connected to Melbourne, lots of buyers coming to places like that out of Melbourne because of its affordability and lifestyle, um, very good rental yields and um, a, uh, an economy with uh, with strong future prospects. So I would also consider that one in that price range. I think it'd be a really good place to consider. So the yeah. Latrobe Valley towns like uh, Trelgan, Murray and Morwell. Okay. So that's a very long-winded answer to your question. Um, any follow-up questions? Yeah, yeah. So uh, because of the the price range, so in in uh, in Wagga, which I, I did because uh, I didn't don't know the area there, when I called up one of the agents, that I, I found that there was quite a lot of um, government um, housing in in some of the towns there. 
would, yeah. would, would that be something to stay clear of to make sure that or, or, that those sort of housing or you know, the housing that the governments are buying up there? Yeah, I, I just think, you know, it's, it's a question of you firstly decide um, the, the broad location that you think is going to be a good place to, to own real estate because of the underlying economy and all the factors we've just talked about. Then when you start to get down to specifics, looking for the individual property, you just want to perhaps avoid those areas that, that concern you um, that might show up in your research to have perhaps um, a higher level of government housing or um, there might be some areas that have a, a higher crime rate than others, those sorts of things. But um, you just, um, you know, it's just the basics of choosing a location on the ground. You want to be yeah. um, close to um, schools, medical facilities, uh, shopping, public transport, those sorts of things, and avoid those areas that perhaps have a, a bad reputation. Yeah, um, okay. So it's not, it's not a huge issue, just something to be mindful of when yeah. you're at street level picking the individual property you want to buy. Yeah. Okay. So, and one final question. Uh, a lot could also again because of the price range. A lot, a lot of the houses are built pre eighty seven. Would that be a, a reason to not like sort of move forward if you can't get the depreciation? Um, well, I'm going to be speaking in uh, just a moment to um, Peter Folds from Washington Brown, and his special topic, of course, is depreciation. So. Okay. Um, we might um, throw that question to him. Okay. Generally speaking, uh, Michael, I don't think you should base your choice of um, your investment on tax benefits. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's, it's a, um, something you should consider perhaps would not be the prime reason. Mm -hmm. But if you, you're buying in an area, I think um, ideally you'd, you'd perhaps be buying something that's not brand new, but mm -hmm. near new, maybe five to ten years old. You're still going to be getting, I think, some good, pretty good uh, depreciation benefits um, that sort of property but it's really more about the maintenance issues that mm. the older the property the more likely you're going to have um, to spend money on over time on maintenance issues and of course before you uh, commit to buying a property you should always get it thoroughly checked out by uh, building and pest inspectors to make sure there aren't any major issues to give yourself yeah. some comfort there but um, I think that the biggest issue for older property is the ongoing uh, spending on uh, on fixing stuff. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, but stay tuned, uh, Michael. We'll we'll just um, I might um, now bring um, Peter Foles from Washington Brown, and he's waiting patiently in the background. Oh, there he goes. Hello, Peter. Hi, Terry. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. good. And you probably heard the question that um, Michael asked it just at the end of um, our our discussion. Um, just 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 wondering about um, you know older property and and depreciation issues. So it's a great opportunity since you're there in the background to, to yep. bring you in and maybe have a, a bit of a chat about that before we talk about the webinar we're gonna be doing together soon. Fantastic, um, yeah, great segue. Uh, so thanks, uh, Michael, for asking that question. Um, Terry, as you correctly responded, you know, we, we specialize in tax depreciation. Um, we'd very much be the first to tell a, a property investor um, not to base the uh, purchase decision on tax depreciation. Um, very, very important, uh, can be very, very beneficial to an investor's bottom line, um, but certainly shouldn't be one of the, uh, you know, the, the main focuses when assessing a, um, a property investments criteria for, for performance. Um, Michael was quite right by saying um, for a pre-87 property, um, are there, there tax depreciation benefits? Well, yes, there are. Um, you cannot claim depreciation on the structural component of a property, or the original structure, I should say, of a property built um, before 87. But what we would expect to see uh, with the vast majority and have seen with the vast majority of properties that are being purchased now that were built pre-87 is they've had um, some form of a varying degree of renovation done or improvement. Terry, that might be um, bathrooms, kitchens, a, a pergola, um, awnings, decking. Now, you are very much, the, the new owner is very much entitled to claim depreciation deductions on the um, any post 87 improvements, structural improvements. So there would still be depreciation benefits there. We'd certainly want to look into that um, for you, Michael. 
Okay, well, thanks for that, um, Peter and Michael. I'm, I'm sure that um, uh, it is helpful in terms of helping you to make some of your choices as you go forward. Good luck, good luck with that. But Peter, um, you and I are going to be having a longer chat um, a couple of weeks from now, Tuesday the 5th of May, we're going to be doing one of our uh, regular webinar events together. Yes. Um, and it's an opportune time because um, we're uh, approaching the end of the financial year when uh, thoughts turn to tax time. And that's when um, most people start to think, um, people tend to leave things to the last minute. And yes. Maybe, maybe we need to get busy and get a depreciation report done. Um, so our topic on the 5th of May is what investors need to know about tax depreciation in a pandemic, yes. which just puts a, a completely new wrinkle on, on the subject that we might otherwise be talking about. Um, so yeah. um, um, look, and, and that's uh, not using the word pandemic uh, to create alarm or sensationalism, um, but uh, just stating a, a fact about the current global situation we're all uh, enduring at the moment. It does add an extra spin to this, Terry, um, at, at this time of the year, approaching the end of financial year, as you mentioned, um, our industry um, there really ramps up. Certainly a case of um, people thinking, well, what about that depreciation schedule that I've been putting off? So we start to get very, very busy now, and rightly so, people wanna have the, make sure they've got their depreciation schedule ready to go um, by the time tax lodgement comes around so that they can maximize their, their tax deductions. That's, that's the, the case as it would be in a, in a normal world. We now have the uh, additional consideration and somewhat limitations um, to consider because of the COVID-19 situation. Um, and by that specifically, I'm talking about inspections, um, conducting property inspections as part of uh, preparing depreciation reports. Um, in, the, in the past, um, that's been a, a, a requirement or of a significant benefit. Um, and there are now changes, of course, to that um, posed by the, the risk of, of um, contact. So, yeah, yep, we'll be uh, definitely diving into that a bit more and, and what a, a landlord needs to be considering when, um, when approaching this. So. Okay. And, um, of course, we're going to talk about all these issues in, in detail uh, over the uh, uh, about 60 minutes uh, on the 5th of May. But... Um, just briefly, I know in, in previous uh, recent uh, webinars that we've done together, we just touched on the, the issue of false economy, people balking at spending a few hundred dollars on getting a depreciation schedule done versus the many thousands of dollars and benefits to their bottom line if, if they do that um, for the, their investment property. Um, perhaps we could just touch on that. Sure, happy to do so. Um, yeah, you know, typically a, a depreciation report, um, yes, it is, it is a, an expense. Um, once again, in a, a normal environment, uh, many investors think, well, you know, I've just incurred the cost of the investment and other property related um, expenditure. Do I really want to go spending a, another, you know, uh, $700, $600 on a, on a depreciation report right now? Um, the answer, of course, is yes, you should, and not just because I sell tax depreciation reports. It's it's because now more than ever, um, property investors need to be uh, maximising their cash flow. So you know, maximising what they can um, claim on their tax or, or reduce their tax by, and the depreciation report is a fantastic way of ensuring um, that uh, investors are saving as much as possible. They're not leaving any taxable tax deductible dollars on the table. So um, very, very important. Um, Terry, in a conversation you and I had recently, we were when we were discussing this, we were looking at some other uh, property related expenses taking uh, time or a longer period of time. Yes, they're a benefit, but it takes a bit longer to, to sort of see the tangible effects of that. I guess from a depreciation perspective, we're lucky in the sense that the expenditure on the report itself is fully tax deductible. Um, and at this time of the year, you're likely to see um, significant financial benefits within the next few months. Um, and for, for a lot of people that are doing it a bit tougher now because um, of work-related reasons, that's um, uh, even more of a reason to, to uh, make sure the depreciation deductions are there and they're minimising their, their tax expenditure. Yeah, I don't think there's any better example of getting a direct 
a massive return on a small expenditure in property investment than in getting a depreciation schedule done because of the dramatic impact it can have on your bottom line um, when you do your tax return. So thank you, Peter, for, for coming on tonight. Um, Peter and I will be having a more detailed discussion about these issues and a whole lot more on Tuesday, the 5th of May um, at lunchtime, about 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, what investors need to know about tax depreciation in a pandemic. And uh, I urge you all to, to register for that event. You can do so on the, uh, the hotspotting.com website. And we'll look forward to your participation in that event in two weeks' time. So thanks again, Peter, for coming on board tonight, just so we could uh, let people know about that. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Stay safe and well and look forward to speaking with you in the near future, Terry. All the best. Good night. Okay, Peter, thank you. Okay, just, just returning now to the questions. There's, there's so many coming through tonight and I thank you for your, your participation and for your questions. Um, David is asking, what are your thoughts on reports of vacancy rates on the rise around the country? Yeah, um, David, there's no doubt that uh, in some locations, at least, we are seeing vacancy rates rise. And the prime reason for that is that uh, investors who owned um, property that they previously had in the short-term rental market, uh, um, specifically Airbnb, now, of course, that's not producing a return for them. So they're now putting their properties into the long-term rental. They're competing in the uh, residential rental market for um, longer-term tenants, permanent residential tenants. So we're seeing an increase in, in some locations, at least in um, vacancy rates. Uh, I think working um, to counterbalance that, David, is the fact that in the vast majority of locations around Australia, both capital cities and regional centres, vacancies have been very, very low. All of our capital cities, um, at, as at the end of March, had vacancy rates well below 3%, and many of them were below 2%, some were below 1%. And uh, the work that we do at Hotspotting, um, we know that throughout regional Australia, there's many regional centres with vacancy rates of 1%, 1.5%. So there's capacity there, I think, for markets to absorb that extra stock in the market uh, without vacancy rates blowing out to the degree that uh, we're going to see uh, rentals dropping. Uh, in, some, in some places they will perhaps, uh, but I don't think it's going to be a, a major problem. Um, the longer this thing goes on, of course, the more it would be a problem, but I think the indications very strongly are that uh, we're now having the conversation of um, how we start to uh, ease the restrictions and that's going to help um, with uh, the problem of uh, rising vacancies. So I think it's short term. I don't think it's a major problem for markets generally speaking, David, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the markets, most markets around the country can absorb the situation. Um, Nash is asking, do you think banks will start imposing lending restrictions due to this COVID-19 situation? Um, like, I think the, the main impacts, and as far as lenders go, Nash, is that they are scrutinising um, borrowers even more stringently than they were. Um, since the Royal Commission, um, they have certainly uh, been tougher in their scrutinising of, of the situation of borrowers, their spending habits, for example. Um, in the current climate, I think they're, they're being even more stringent. And uh, there's evidence that they are, for want of a better word, discriminating against certain um, professions, industry sectors, people who work in hospitality, for example, are going to find it much harder to get a loan than they might have done three months ago. Uh, so that's, I think those are the ma major impacts that we're seeing in terms of the attitude of lenders. Certainly um, lenders are, are keen to lend. Um, they're, uh, it's a very competitive industry um, and their, um, their bottom line is gonna be impacted by this situation. So they need to keep on lending. Um, so they're keen and it's competitive um, also with second tier lenders in the market but um, they are uh, looking very, very carefully at um, about um, the situation for borrowers. But having said that, it's still possible to get, get loans. And, and um, we did a webinar, a panel webinar with members of our panel of partners uh, last week. And Louise Lucas, who's a, 
um, one of Australia's leading mortgage brokers was on the panel and she said it's possible even the current climate to get approvals for loans to buy property in a matter of two or three days with some lenders. So, um, but generally speaking, I think particularly the big four banks have um, uh, become a little bit tougher. Um, Natasha via Facebook, how do I find reports on the website? So you're looking for Bendigo. Um, the layout has changed a little bit. Um, Natasha, we're no longer selling uh, individual location reports, but if you're interested in an area like say Bendigo, um, it features very prominently in the national top 10 um, regional hotspots report, which we published in the past week. Um, it's also, you'll find it in the, uh, the top five uh, regional Victorian hotspots report. Um, so that's where you would find information about uh, Bendigo. So if you get, for example, the um, national top 10 regional, you'll find lots of good information about Bendigo, but you also may, um, in the other sections of the report, see some other good possibilities um, around regional Australia. Um, there's just so many good locations. It's very hard choosing just 10 for a report like that. And for top five regional Victoria, it's hard just whittling down the list to just five because there's so many good locations where there's strong local economies, prices and demand have been rising uh, coming into this um, pandemic period. And uh, I think out the other side, they're gonna be good places to own real estate. Um, Opinda is um, asked me other predictions of 30% drop in real estate prices going to happen. I don't think there's even a remote chance that that's going to happen. Um, I think there's only one source out there that's um, touched on predictions like that. And of course, media being media has chosen to focus on that and they've also uh, sensationalised what was actually said. I think they're referring to a prediction by Shane Oliver, Chief Economist AMP Capital, who has a bit of a track record for, of predicting um, major drops in real estate values. He hasn't been right yet. He's been doing it for the last 15 years and he's been wrong every year. Um, but I think um, what he was actually saying has been misrepresented by some sections of media have a tendency to embellish, um, for want of a better word. Um, I think uh, what he actually said was that in an absolute worst case scenario, if certain things happen like unemployment going to 15 or 20 percent then there may be uh, drops in real estate goes as much as 30 percent but as as baseline predictions are much more moderate than that and most forecasters um, um, are, are suggesting outcomes not remotely like that so I, I don't think there's any chance of that happening one of the reasons is that the situation that we're in is um, is a short-term one we're, we're starting to talk about coming out the other side of it already, um, even though we've only been in this sort of shutdown period for about a month. Um, so um, with the stimulus measures that have been implemented by the federal government, most projections are that unemployment will be perhaps nine or 10%. And I'd remind you that the last time we had unemployment at that level in Australia was the last time we had a recession, which was the early nineties um, when we had, um, unemployment around 10% for quite a long period, but real estate values didn't drop in that period. Real estate actually um, in more the capital cities, in the three years to 1993, they all had growth in their median house prices. And uh, Perth, I recall, had um, grew 27% across those three years. So the fact that unemployment is likely to go to those levels is not a reason to believe that we're going to have a major drop in real estate values. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, because um, unemployment at those levels isn't sufficient to precipitate a major collapse in property values. But the fact, as I said, I think it's going to be a short term situation and we're going to come out the other side of it very strongly. Um, Katie. How important is access to transport for the future of the renter? Um, like I think, um, Transport is, is a very important consideration in terms of choosing a location. I think um, you first choose the, the broad location, the, the town, the city, the suburb, um, the general area that you want to buy in. And then when you start looking at, at street level to buy the individual property, 
Um, it can't get down to basics. It's not rocket science. You want, I mean, I suppose the, the sweet spot, as some people have put it, is um, maybe 200 metres from public transport, like a train station, uh, 200 metres from shopping, 200 metres from schools. Um, that's the sweet spot. So you, those are the things you want to be close to. Public transport, I think, is, is important. Um, if you've got a choice between, say, two suburbs, you'll like them both equally, but one has a train, a commuter train station and the other doesn't, I'd go for the one that has the train station. Um, so those are the sort of simple criteria that you can apply. I mean, we've done some research in the past which shows that um, city suburbs with commuter train stations have higher capital growth rates than those that don't. So um, for those and other reasons, I think... Um, Proximity to public transport is an important factor in choosing a location. Okay. Um, Al Francis is asking, will the market in Milani and surrounds decrease during this period? Um, family wanting to buy, I'm wondering if there will be an optimum time. Look, I think my, my general view is that if you are um, ready to buy, um, now's a pretty good time to be looking uh, in this market. Um, there will be opportunities to buy well. I don't think it makes any sense to me to, um, to sort of step back and wait for the market to fall and, and when it hits bottom, someone rings a bell and you jump in and buy at that time. It doesn't really work like that. If you're ready to buy now, now's a good time to be looking because um, there aren't very many buyers in the market in, general terms and there's a possibility of buying well if there's a vendor out there with a property that you like and they need to sell um, in a hurry they might accept perhaps a, a lower offer than they otherwise would so um, in terms of Mulaney which I know pretty well because that's where I'm sitting right now um, I don't really expect um, to see any major declines in values in this area um, because of the nature of, of the local area, the nature of the town. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, a lot of people come to retire in Mullaney, so it's got an older population. Um, and uh, I just, you know, people won't be signed because they don't need to sell. Um, I've been speaking to, to local agents in the last week or so, and they're finding there's still um, good demand from genuine buyers in the market. Um, what's gone from the market and people all over Australia telling me this, people who are either buyers agents or selling agents is that the tire kickers have gone from the market. There's not as many inquiries, but the inquiries they're getting are genuine inquiries and they kind of like that because they're, they're not wasting time on people who are just basically tire kickers. Mulaney does tend to get a lot of tire kickers because people come up, um, weekenders from, from Brisbane and elsewhere and they poke around local real estate, but they're not really serious buyers. So they're gone from the market at the moment. The ones that are um, making inquiries in places like Mulaney are genuine uh, buyers. And so uh, no deals are still happening. Um, Pumika's asking any new land releases in Queensland. It's kind of, um, well, yeah, but Queensland's a very big place and across the length and breadth of Queensland, there's, there's lots of, um, new housing estates happening uh, in the Brisbane area, on the Sunshine Coast, the Gold Coast, um, you, know, you name it. Um, certainly um, there are major new estates, master plan communities that are underway, um, new housing estates of various shapes and sizes. So is there any um, particular area that interests you? Perhaps you could come back in again and specify some locations you're interested in. Um, just a reminder that um, I've uh, referenced um, earlier in the evening um, a couple of webinars, one that's coming up next week and the other with Peter Foles we had on as a guest a moment ago the following week. Um, both those webinars are on the events page of the Hotspotting website. So if you're interested in those, you can go there, click on events on the, on the home page and it'll take you through and you can uh, register over for the one next week with uh, Miriam Sankula or the following week with Peter Folds from Washington Brown talking about depreciation issues. Anna's asking, uh, 
what regional areas do you recommend in the Hunter Valley? Um, and generally speaking, um, I do like the Hunter Valley as a as a region. I like Newcastle and the Hunter as as a general region. Region um, coming into this strange climate that we're currently in, those areas were showing an uplift in their markets. Um, demand was rising. The sales activity was rising. We're seeing good momentum and prices in those areas. And they've been strong in the past. They're becoming strong again. And once we get out the other side, I think um, that will continue to be the case. Um, I don't know if there's any particular part of the Hunter Valley. I, I mean, the various locations throughout the Hunter Valley have, have their merits. Um, you know, Maitland, uh, Brankston, uh, Singleton, Musselbrook, all, that, all those locations have their merits. Um, just need to be mindful of supply issues. In the past, maybe five, six years ago, that that market broadly went through a period of, it was just, uh, there was an avalanche of developers, large and small, targeted that region as a growth region and built too many um, house and land packages. And so that market dropped for a while, but certainly long since it's recovered from that, um, underpinned by strong local economy, good ties to Newcastle, um, diversity in the economy, so many different factors um, driving uh, the economy of the Hunter Valley. So it's just generally a place I think that's good to consider and very affordable. Um, if you buy there as an investor, you're going to be getting pretty good rental yields. If you're buying, um, you can buy good property in the three and four hundred thousands there and um, just good infrastructure, strong local economy, good place to own real estate. Um, just a reminder also that if you'd like to um, go further than typing in your question, but actually have a, a live conversation with me, you can do that by raising your hand. Um, and uh, okay, Grant has his hand raised. He sent for a couple of questions. Um, so perhaps Katie, you could uh, unmute Grant and we can have uh, a direct conversation about the, uh, the questions you'd like to answer tonight. Hi, Terry. Hi, Grant. Hi, how are you going? Good, thank you. Um, look, just wanted to ask what you thought of the Wollongong and Nowra area, or in fact, anywhere on the south coast of New South Wales, and also after that, uh, perhaps Goulburn. Yeah, OK. In fact, you sent, sent through an email earlier, didn't you, with, with those questions. So I've, I've had a chance to contemplate that a little bit before coming on to the broadcast tonight. Look. Um, what I just said about the Hunter Valley was also true for the area around Wollongong that um, sort of in the, the latter part of last year and the early part of this year, there was a noticeable uplift in uh, the Wollongong market. We could see a demand starting to rise again because perhaps Wollongong went through a, an up phase and peaked, you know, maybe two or three years ago and was, had sort of passed its peak, but it was starting to come back as we entered this uh, pandemic period. So it was starting to come strong again. And um, it doesn't surprise me. I think long-term, it would be a great place to own real estate. It's a strong city in its own right, um, but it's also well connected to, to Sydney. And so it's, for some people, it's a, an alternative. Um, you know, the Southern Highlands, um, Wollongong, and then north of Sydney, the Central Coast, all places that get buyers from from people who want to perhaps get out of the city, and increasingly with um, with technology and with um, maybe better transport connections, more and more people don't actually need to be in the central city for their jobs, their careers. They can perhaps work from home more, and that's being exacerbated by the current situation, which is forcing people to work from home. So I think we're going to see an enhancement of that trend where people are leaving the big cities and going to regional areas are still within maybe one to two hours of the big city. And uh, so locations like um, Wollongong, I think are going to benefit from that. But in its own right, it's also a very strong city. It's been a city that's transformed its economy uh, over recent years from where it used to be more of a, a blue collar smokestack type economy with big manufacturing. It's not so much about that anymore. It's more about education and medical services and high tech industry. So it's 
it's um, it's evolved very very well with that new more modern economy, and I think it's going to be very good going forward. Um, and Goulburn is a place uh, that we like um, as a, an affordable alternative to um, Canberra. It's close enough to Canberra for people to, to live there and perhaps commute. Uh, but you know, Goulburn's you know, a good, good, strong economy in its own right with diversity. Um, it benefits from being in that growth corridor between Canberra and Sydney. So between our biggest city and our capital city, and um, future projects like the fast rail connection that's been talked about will stand Goulburn in good stead. Um, but, you know, it's much more affordable than Canberra. And so and people um, sort of choose to, to buy there for that reason, amongst other reasons. So any follow up questions there, Grant? Um, oh, how about Nara? How would you put place Nara in that, that area? Yeah. Um, I sort of don't know as much about now as I do about Goulburn or Wollongong. Um, we've looked at it in the past and it's been you know, a good solid regional centre with different things going on it's a, in its economy. Um, so it's, um, but I sort of don't feel well enough informed to sort of give you an informed opinion about that. But, um, well, how well, about anywhere else, anywhere else on the South Coast that you like? Um, we noticed that, you know, that sort of general uh, Shoalhaven area was another area that was really coming strong. Um, you know, we, we recently completed the latest edition of the Price Predictor Index, where we look at every sort of town and suburb in the country in terms of what's happening with sales volumes and what's happening with prices. And that Shoalhaven area really uh, came up strongly as with rising demand and prices starting to move. Haven't had a chance to look in detail as to what's actually driving that, but I think I suspect it's it's very much to do with with just lifestyle. You know, that, those are that that whole area down south of Sydney is you know wonderful lifestyle, um, nice sort of quiet lifestyle communities um, at a, an, an affordable price. And I think that's sort of what drives the demand in those areas. A certain uh, amount of it's um, people retiring from larger places, I think. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Grant, for, for coming on and for participating. Um, hope that's been helpful. Um, so just, just moving on. Um, oh, Katie, you have mentioned there that uh, Bumaka was also got a um, hand raised. So perhaps we could uh, go there and have a brief conversation as well. Sorry, Terry, she's left the meeting. However, Arthur and Tara both have their hand up. Okay, well, um, well, let, let's let's connect to one of those. Uh, Arthur, you're live. Oh, hi, Terry, again. Uh, hi. Terry, thanks for the info you're giving. I uh, think from an investor's point of view, uh, a couple of comments have been raised about immigration because of the incredible drop of people coming from overseas. What's your take or, or thoughts on, on how that's going to affect the investment market in the near future or even longer term? What's, uh, what's the unknown? Yeah, look... Um... I mean, there's obviously a, a restriction on that kind of movement at the moment. Um, are you referring to that or are you referring to perhaps a, a longer term sort of drop off in immigration levels? Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, short term, but also uh, three, six months, 12 months. Uh, what seems to be the general thought? You might be doing a lot more reading than I am. Yeah, look, I don't think there's, there's any sort of you know, getting beyond the pandemic period where there's a restriction on you know, people coming into the country, of course. Uh, but getting beyond that, I don't think there's any sort of long-term uh, systemic reduction in immigration. And, and it's a very uh, important factor um, to both Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be continue to be the case. Um, Sydney actually loses population um, 
to interstate migration, but it gains from overseas migration. So it's very important to Sydney in terms of demand coming in. Melbourne um, has growth from both types of migration. People come from other parts of Australia, um, coming into Melbourne as well as people from overseas. And it's very much a driver of the Melbourne market. I think it's going to continue to be. Um, it's um, in particular Melbourne. I think um, taking a, a medium to long term view, I think Melbourne is, is one of the you know the strongest cities in the country in terms of um, being a good place to own real estate. I think it's going to take a short term hit from this um, being a major auction city. So it's going to be impacted by that um, to a certain degree. And what about South East Queensland? South East Queensland, um, look, overseas migration is, is not such a big factor there, but interstate migration is. In fact, South East or Queensland generally is the, the strongest state in terms of net gains from interstate migration movements. Um, and most of that goes to South East Queensland, um, Brisbane, the Gold Coast, the Sunshine Coast. And, and so that's a very strong factor for them. Um, so we see that continuing and perhaps strengthening as we go forward because of um, you know, affordability is, and cost of living is a driver of that to a large degree. So Sydney does lose population to interstate migration um, because it's um, you know, a big city, an expensive city, congested perhaps, and people are um, heading towards um, smaller cities that are more affordable like Brisbane. So that's a big factor there, and I see that continuing amongst other reasons. I mean, Brisbane coming into this uh, pandemic period was definitely a market on the up. Um, it, um, infrastructure spending was getting stronger. The economy was getting stronger. Interstate migration was helping. Uh, the affordability comparison between Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne was helping. And so I think once we get beyond this period, that will continue, and Brisbane's going to have a strong growth rate. One that it's been threatening to have for a number of years but hasn't had yet so I think it's it's overdue and um, once we get beyond uh, the, the shutdown period I think Brisbane's going to go ahead strongly. Just on that point Terry I came across an article that you wrote in 2015 I think it was in the Courier Mail where you show that the growth from 1970 to 2015 the capital growth was greater than Sydney. Of course Sydney had a burst recently but that was an interesting article. Yeah, I mean, Sydney, um, before that burst, had, had done quite poorly in the previous 10 years. Other smaller cities had done better. Um, and Perth was one of them. Brisbane was one of them. So you know, traditionally, Brisbane's been a growth city in terms of population and in terms of its real estate market. Um, and it is overdue for another surge. And it was beginning to have it in the latter part of 2019, early 2020, it was definitely moving into that growth phase that was overdue. And the situation, no doubt, it puts that on pause. But I think um, once we get beyond the situation that um, Brisbane will, will continue to move because the things that we're driving are still happening. The big infrastructure projects are still happening. Uh, the population growth is still happening. And uh, those fundamentals will continue. I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, just one other question I did ask, a brief comment here. Scale uh, or hierarchy of renters' needs. Uh, you mentioned, you touched on it before. The um, the working from home situation. Uh, they're saying that that's going to be more permanent now. So, is there a bit of a hierarchy change of renters' needs? Uh, uh, how do you mean uh, hierarchy of, of change? I'm not sure what you're driving right. at. I guess uh, access to transport to get onto trains or something would be people working from home um, don't have to be close into the centre of the city as much? Well, that's right. I, th I think that that trend um, puts people into different locations. And I think primarily it puts them into regional lifestyle areas, primarily within, say, one hour or maybe two hours of the capital city. That's why we've seen so much growth in regional Victoria, Ballarat, Bendigo, and um, hill change towns, smaller places like Gisborne and Kyneton and Castlemaine, those sorts of places. Um, Central Coast, just north of Sydney as well. I think those are the areas that, that stand to benefit from that. They have done already. Um, they were starting to rise again, such as the Central Coast 
outside Sydney was, was starting to rise as we came into this period. Um, and I think that's going to be exacerbated by this lockdown, which has forced people to work from home. Um, and it's kind of exacerbated the, the emphasis on technology and what you can do with it. And it's been an eye opener for some people, I guess. Um, and um, just confirm um, the views of others that um, using technology, not needing to be, you know, going into the Sydney CBD or the Melbourne CBD to work is, um, is a very attractive prospect for some people. So I think those regional markets within striking distance of the capital cities are the ones that are going to benefit. I appreciate that and thank you. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, Katie, you mentioned uh, another person who also had their hand up. Perhaps we could uh, switch to them. Yes, Tara has her hand up. I'll switch her on now. Thanks, Katie. Actually, unfortunately, Tara is using an old version of Zoom that won't let her talk live, so um, okay. we can't do her. Grant has his hand up again. Uh, if you would like to um, uh, take his another... Oh, no, he's put his hand down. You can just go back to questions. Okay, we'll, we'll focus on some of the, the written questions that are there, um, and then we'll perhaps um, do some more, more live conversations. Um, Michael um, asked what he expected of Sydney and Melbourne in the next 12 months growth-wise. Um, look, um, generally speaking, I think um, a short, sharp, short-term hit uh, is likely. And um, we haven't actually seen it yet. And um, we'll just, just refer you to um, the latest price figures. Um, you know, at the beginning of April, we had both CoreLogic and SQM Research publish their, their figures for what happened to prices in March. And, and in both cases, they show that prices actually continued to rise in March, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, the share market and the lockdown started on the 20th of February. Um, and but media's attitude was, well, it's too soon to see the impact on real estate. We're going to see, you know, a big drop in April. Well, the latest figures are actually out today from SQM Research and their We've got their, their rolling month uh, figures, for example, which are right up to the minute. And uh, there's no strong evidence in those figures yet. Um, here we are in the like three quarters of the way through April. So it's been two months since we had that first uh, share market crash um, and still no strong, compelling evidence of any major impact on prices. According to these figures, in the last month up to this week, Sydney is has continued to rise. Melbourne has continued to rise. Canberra, Darwin and Hobart have also risen uh, to some degree in the capital city average. Uh, in the past month, there's a rise of 0.5%. So it's not a strong rise, but any rise at all, I think would be remarkable in the current circumstances. So um, as yet, we haven't seen uh, any evidence of uh, a major drop off in property values. And, um, you know, we're, we're far enough into this uh, situation for if we're going to have a major impact, uh, we're, we should be seeing some evidence of it by now, but we haven't. Um, nevertheless, I think as it goes on, and the longer we're in it, um, I think Sydney and Melbourne will take a short term hit, but then um, I think we'll come back strongly. I think, you know, Australia as an economy, as a nation, and its property markets will recover strongly and I base that um, on historical uh, evidence as well as um, the the strength of the markets going into this thing so um, I don't think we're going to see um, any significant falls and certainly not long-term ones in Sydney or Melbourne. Um, Dale was asking where do you see land prices in the future um, a little bit hard to answer because it's, it's just a little bit broad, Dale. Um, we're specifically here talking because there's, there's, as I keep saying to people, there's no one situation in Australia. You can't, um, although some economists do, and I think they make fools of themselves when they do it, they talk about Australian property prices, they're going to do X in the next 12 months. Well, I'm sorry, we don't have one market. We have lots of different markets, thousands of different markets. And we're going to have markets where prices will be rising, others where they'll be stagnating, in others where they'll be falling. And that's always the case. So 
Now I need to know a little bit more about um, some specifics um, before um, I could really give you an answer to that. Okay. Um, Bumaka was asking about Bendigo, so I'll hold. I, um, I've recently bought myself one in the last 12 months, certainly in Bendigo. Um, I, I would be looking to buy there. Um, I wouldn't, if you own um, property there, I certainly wouldn't be selling. I think Bendigo's got a, a very strong future. That's why I bought there myself. And um, nothing has happened in the period since I bought there to change that view. I think it's got a very, very strong future. So if you own property there, hang on to it. I think it's going to do well. Um, uh, Deb is asking, are you seeing an increase in mortgage and possession sales? If so, where well, look, um, I'm not seeing any evidence of it as yet. Um, there are always mortgage and possession sales happening at any point in time, and I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that there's um, there been an upturn. You've got to remember that you now the situation we've been we're in it. Um, in terms of shutdown and the impact that's had on people, it's, it's only been around for about a month. You know, it's, it's very recent and um, it, you wouldn't really expect to see it translate into people selling their homes in desperate situations. Um, and um, even for those who have perhaps had their business shut down or lost their jobs, it doesn't automatically turn into a desperate situation in terms of the house. What you've got to remember is in Australia, right across Australia, most households are actually ahead on their mortgage repayments. Through this period of very low interest rates, people have been making extra payments. And the average situation, so this, the stats tell us, is um, the average household is two and a half years ahead on their mortgage repayments. So for someone who um, perhaps has had reduced income or, or lost their job in this period, it doesn't necessarily mean they're in a desperate situation in terms of their mortgage because they're ahead. And um, the CEO of the Commonwealth Bank last week told us, uh, it's uh, Matt Common, CEO of the Commonwealth Bank, the biggest um, mortgage lender in the country, that the people have actually applied for a mortgage holiday, that, which has been offered by the major banks. If you're in difficulty, we can suspend your mortgage payments for maybe six months. Well, only 3.9% of their home loan customers have actually applied for that. So you know, less than 4% of people feel that they need that, um, which just shows you how strong the situation is in Australia in terms of people and their property loans. So um, I don't really expect to see an avalanche of mortgage and possession sales, um, particularly as you know this is a short-term thing. We're already talking about um, the terms and the timing of exiting the restrictions. So I don't think it's going to be around long enough to cause a lot of that. Um, Wes is asking, would uh, Geelong be a good option as well, since it's so close to Melbourne? Uh, look, Geelong is, is a very good option. I mean, it's in its own right, a very strong city with a strong economy long term. Yeah, great place to own real estate. It's going to continue to be seen as an affordable lifestyle alternative to Melbourne. You know, it's, it's more affordable in central Melbourne, um, but it's got good links to Melbourne. It's been through a growth phase. It's past its peak. So um, the best time to buy there would have been you know, two to three years ago. But long term, I think it's going to be a good place to own real estate. Um, Nash is asking, does Ballarat feature in the top five or 10 regional hotspots in Australia? Certainly in Victoria. Um, not so much, um, I don't think, just trying to remember whether it's in our top 10 region we publish. No, it's not. Bendigo is. The thing is, Ballarat's already had substantial growth. Um, what I just said about Geelong, I think also applies to Ballarat, long-term great place to own real, own real estate. It's going to continue to thrive because it's a strong city in its own right, a growing city, um, but it's also got great links to Melbourne. It's going to continue to get buyers out of Melbourne. Um, but I um, just feel that it's probably sort of, you know, had substantial growth. The best time to buy there was a couple of years ago, but um, going forward long term, um, I think Ballarat is going to be really, really strong. It's going to continue to get demand uh, from all sorts of places, but particularly out of Melbourne. 
Yeah, as uh, Katie has pointed out, their Nash ballots in the latest top five regional Victorian hotspots report. So you can find out most of what you need to know um, in that report. Um, Deb is asking how to explain the surge in places like, um, sorry, Deb, uh, the surge in prices, demand. I'm not quite sure what you're driving at. Could you come back in and perhaps expand on that question about Port Macquarie? Because it is a place that we we track. Um, it's done well in the past, and it's, it's you know, and it's a good, good, strong regional city. Um, Kate is asking, what are your two best regional suburbs in the current regional report? Well, not so much suburbs. We, we look at areas in terms of perhaps local government areas, uh, regional towns and cities. Um, I've talked about Bendigo, um, which we rate very highly. Um, the Sunshine Coast in Queensland also rates very highly. Um, it's a market which is holding up very well in the current situation. Um, here in Tide White Valuers uh, just published a report um, talking about what's happened to values on the Sunshine Coast in the current climate and basically saying they haven't seen any evidence of falling values. It's a very strong economy, um, lots of big infrastructure spending happening, even though it's got a strong tourism sector and that's taking a hit. There's other things happening on the Sunshine Coast, like its medical precinct, the new CBD, which is under construction, other big infrastructure projects that are happening and creating economy and jobs, which is continuing to drive the Sunshine Coast. So those are two that rate highly. Orange in New South Wales is another one that stands out for us at the moment and one that's probably be going to handle this current period and come out the other side pretty strong. Um, okay. Lara saying, what would you, what would your response be to those who say that buying is like catching the sharpest falling knife ever? Um, all of them, so I'm not quite sure what you're driving out there, but I think you might be suggesting that buying now, you're going to be buying something that's going to fall. I don't think so. Um, I think buying now, looking now makes a lot of sense to me because there will be opportunities to buy well. Um, you just target the areas that have the credentials for long-term growth. Um, there's plenty of them. And I think um, I don't think um, Australia's going to suffer in any long-term way from the current situation. I think it's going to come out of it and um, we're going to have a resources boom. I think once the restrictions are lifted, that people are going to get out and spend, um, go to restaurants and cafes and movies. Um, there's um, a research survey was done and published in the past few days showing that the um, majority of Australians are planning to do all of that. Um, when the restrictions are lifted, they're, they're desperately keen to get, get back out there and spend in cafes and restaurants to take domestic holidays. And I think um, Australia's gonna come back pretty strongly from this. And some sectors will boom, including the resources sector. I think we're gonna see a revival of manufacturing in Australia in certain areas. and. Um, another positive trend. So I don't think there's any reason why people shouldn't be looking to buy now and to seize opportunities to buy well, as long as they choose locations that have good underlying fundamentals. Um, Dale's asking, how much influence does the international economy have on the Australian market? Um, not a lot, um, you know, if there was, you know, the worst case scenario, there was a, you know, a, a massive global recession that would impact on the Australian economy and the Australian economy does have impact on property markets. Um, but I think the most significant thing for me that came out of the report from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, last week, which um, got quite a bit of publicity in Australia, but, you know, they being... Australian media, they tended to focus on any of the ne negative aspects. But one of the things that was overlooked that I thought was extremely significant was that 
the IMF is projecting that China this year will have economic growth, despite everything is going to deliver some level of economic growth this year. And next year is projecting that its economic growth rate will be 9.2%. So that augurs extremely well for um, the Australian economy because China is our number one trading partner. And it's a huge buyer of Australian resources. That's one of the reasons why I think coming out of this, Australia is going to have another resources boom as um, nations like China fight back and start to seek to regain their former economic position. So I think um, that's the greatest impact, Dale, that I think that the international economy is going to have on the Australian market. It's going to provide impetus for certain areas. Okay. Just looking at some of the, the questions in the Q and A panel here. Um, Phil is asking what a change in Queensland government be a shot in the arm for real estate in Queensland. Um, seems poor running the economy has impacted prices for some time. Look, I don't really think it's going to have, would have a material impact. I think people tend to overrate, um, you know, elections and changes of the government in terms of impact on real estate markets. Um, we always see that when there's an election coming up, um, pe people just stop making decisions about things like real estate as if the outcome of the, re -election, the election is going to change the fundamentals of real estate investment. Um, and they don't, particularly not long term. I mean, it's just, I think that's uh, crazy thinking. Um, people overrate these things. Um, I don't see that a change in government in Queensland is going to have any particular impact on, on real estate in Queensland. Um, there have been parts of the Queensland market which have done very well in recent years. Um, we've seen you know, good growth in locations like the Sunshine Coast, for example, I referred to earlier, which has been um, one of the strongest markets in the country. Noosa has had fantastic growth in the last two or three years, as one example. We've seen... Um, Good recovery in markets like uh, like Mackay, and um, coming into this period, Cairns market was starting to rise. I'm pretty sure that that will stop um, in this period because of its uh, reliance on tourism. But um, I think Queensland generally, in particular Brisbane, is coming into a period of growth in its real estate markets. A bit of a pause button being pushed because of the current situation. But I think once we get beyond it. Brisbane will be strong and some parts of regional Queensland, I think, will be strong. I think Townsville's due for a growth period. I think it's going to come out of this period stronger than most as well. Uh, Terry, John has his hand raised if you'd like to take a live question. Okay, certainly. Uh, if you could connect me to John, we can have a chat. There you go, John, you're live. Hello, John. So, John doesn't Sorry, seem... Sorry, I can't unmute John's microphone. Okay. Oh, Sorry. Up, there you go. Sorry, very poor on technology. Thank you for the great session, Terry. Okay, John. Thanks for coming back in. Yeah, look, just on the expected pickup in the resources sector, um, does this make uh, uh, locations in, in Western Australia start looking... A bit more interesting again. Yeah, I, I believe it does. And um, Perth was a, in a slightly similar position to Brisbane as we came into this period. Perth has been in downtown for quite a number of years, as you're probably aware, but there was showing strong evidence that, that it was actually in recovery mode late last year and in the early part of 2020. Vacancy rates had dropped a lot. Um, rentals were starting to nudge upwards again. Sales activity was picking up and we're starting to see some price growth in some parts of Perth and the Western Australian economy was, was coming stronger as well. It was starting to produce uh, consistent, steady economic growth for the first time in a while. Um, so once we get beyond this and uh, if we do have the, um, the resources uplift that I expect, particularly with um, um, demand coming out of places like China, then that's going to lift the Western Australian economy 
and that's going to help the Perth property market. Um, so it's a good good place to have a look at the moment. Um, good opportunity to buy there ahead of the growth that I would expect to be coming there. Thank you very much, Terry. If I can just, just throw in another very quick question. Sure. Um, just on, on your recommendation, I, I've been researching the Sunshine Coast, yeah. and it's virtually impossible to get any uh, locations near, near the coast that show a, um, um, well, a, a, good, a good positive cash flow return. Um, yeah. and, uh, one town I've been looking at is, is, is Gympie, and at first glance, it seems to tick all the boxes. You know, really big blocks, um, you know, good potential for, for, for subdivision. It's a, it's a nice area, except for its 6% vacancy factor. What's, what's your take on, on Gympie? It's, it's very affordable, but it's got that high, high um, vacancy factor. Okay, I'm just going to just bring up um, four, five, seven, nine. I just want to... Where did you get the the vacancy rate figure from, John? I am pretty sure I, I got it from from uh, Square, uh, Square Meter Research, um, Terry. Because I'm just looking at that postcode. I'll just double check. I've got the right postcode. Give me four five seven zero. It's it's on SQM Research. It's it's giving me a, a vacancy rate of zero point five percent, which is oh really? Uh huh. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I mean, six percent just didn't sound right to me because yeah, no, no, look, look, I, I must have have uh, mis uh, misinterpreted. Yeah, no, uh, um, I think Gempy is is a is a really good alternative to consider to the Sunshine Sunshine Coast, as as you pointed out. Um, it, it's not a market that it offers particularly good rental returns. It's it's quite an expensive market, and. Um, it's, you know, it's a, I think it's a good place to buy for capital growth going forward. It's got a very strong future. But um, Gempy is is a good alternative, much more affordable, much better rental yields. Uh, it's We're seeing buyers out of the Sunshine Coast going to Gempy, first home buyers, for example, much more affordable to buy there. And it's, it's close enough for people to commute, um, particularly since yeah. they've upgraded the motorway links. And I've spent, you know, there's an ongoing uh, process that's still going on, multi-billion dollar upgrades to the motorway linking um, from the Sunshine Coast up to Gympie and beyond. So it's a good alternative. Um, there's some quite big things happening in the local area economy-wise. There's some, some major projects that like create activity, um, economic activity and jobs. And um, it's got a very ambitious sort of local business community that's working all the time to try and uh, attract investment to Gympie. And uh, I think it's, it's going to be a pretty good place um, going forward. Thank you very much, Terry. You're welcome, John. Thanks for coming on. Okay. Um, look, we've actually, oh my God, we've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. We might just um, take a few more questions, then we probably need to think about wrapping up because um, we're coming up for an hour and a half. We initially planned to be doing this for 60 minutes, but. Um, it's not a bad problem to have, of course, having lots of people showing interest and wanting to ask questions. Abby is asking which areas as an investor I should focus on in coming days from an investment viewpoint. Um, it's such a, a very broad question. Um, Australia's a very, very big country. And, uh, you know, where you should focus, um, the answer to that question, um, similar to the answer to many questions I get, there's no one right answer, Abby. It depends on you, um, um, what you already own, um, how much you earn, how much you can afford to spend, um, how old you are, all these things are, are factors. The answer to these questions is very much about yourself. Um, so it's, it's impossible to answer without, um, you know, knowing more about your situation. Uh, and it's, it's such a broad, there's so many locations around Australia where I think, you know, you could profitably invest um, capital cities with growth prospects, Brisbane, uh, Adelaide, Perth was coming into a growth phase and probably will on the other side of the pandemic period. 
Um, lots of good regional centres that are affordable, have good rental returns and good prospects for growth. But um, the answer um, really can't be narrowed down until um, we know more about um, about you and um, how much you can afford to spend and what you already own, etc., etc. You do ask specifically about the uh, Morton Bay region. Uh, that's in the northern suburbs of Brisbane. I think it's a good place to consider. It offers affordability, uh, pretty good rental yields. I'd be focusing around suburbs like Petrie and, and Launton, which have what I call good real estate bones, all the basics, infrastructure, you know, They've got train stations, commuter train stations, schools, et cetera, et cetera. But the, um, the game changer is the new university campus, which opened in, uh, at the start of this year and ongoing is going to have a big impact on the real estate market in those suburbs, Launton and Petrie in the Morton Bay region in the north of Brisbane. Okay. Just, uh, Stephen is asking what you think of Gladstone. It was starting to recover before the virus it's linked to resources, so maybe it'd be okay. Um, yeah, Stephen, I was actually asked that question by the Gladstone Observer the other day. Um, a reporter rang, so what, what do I think? How do I think Gladstone's going to be impacted? And as you correctly observe, it was actually in a recovery phase um, when we came into the virus period. I don't think Gladstone is going to be too detrimentally affected by that. You've always got to look at the makeup of the local economy. Um, there's a certain element of, of tourism for Gladstone, tourists passing through there, going to uh, some of the offshore islands, for example. But I think fundamentally the Gladstone economy is about the resources sector, and that's pretty strong at the moment, and I think it's going to get stronger. So I think Gladstone, Gladstone's recovery after a long down period Still got a long way to go. I mean, values are still well below they were at the peak, sort of around 2012, 2013. Um, so I'm still fighting back from that. But vacancies are now quite low, whereas they used to be 10%. Now they're below 3%. And it was moving into a period where sales activity was picking up, uh, rents were rising, prices were starting to rise. And I think that will continue, particularly if we have the, the uplift in the resources sector that I expect. Brian's asking about a Chuka in Victoria. Look, it's it's a good place, uh, Brian. Uh, it's one of those places. I mean, we've noticed there's so many regional uh, towns and cities in Victoria have had uplift in the last one to two years, and a Chuka is one of them. It's been going very well. You know, it's it's just a good, solid regional centre. Um, good things happening around it. Um, a certain element of tourism, agricultural economy, uh, affordable, good rental yields. Um, certainly not the worst place in Australia to own a, an investment property. Um, probably not the best either, but um, you know, if you I'm thinking of going there, um, it's um, certainly worth a look. But um, I guess the question that all investors should ask themselves when you're considering an area, is this the absolute best place I can buy in Australia? It's a big country, lots of good places to buy. Um, always ask yourself that question. Is this the best place, the absolute best place that I can uh, buy an investment property in Australia right now? Okay, look, we've still got lots of questions. I'm sorry that there's, there's far too many. We could be here for another couple of hours and we've all now been going for one and a half hours and I think we're at a point where... Um, that we need to call a halt, um, but it does provide an indication that there is um, strong demand for sessions like this where people have a lot of questions. Um, we always get lots of questions about locations, but right now we've got this other layer of questions about the current situation, the virus crisis, how is that going to impact, are product values going to fall, um, what are lenders going to do, all those sorts of questions, um, very um, top of mind for people at the moment. So um, we will do another one of these soon because um, clearly there's lots of interest, but um, 
I think that we've got to the point where we probably should call a halt because um, we've been going um, half an hour longer than we initially intended. So thanks everyone for your participation. Um, sorry that I haven't been able to answer all questions. Um, if anyone would like to follow up um, with a, an urgent question that didn't get answered, um, you can perhaps drop me um, an email, rider at hotspotting.com.au and I'll do my best to answer in the coming days when um, I've got a little bit more time. So thanks for your participation and um, let's do it again soon. Um, thank you, Katie, for your support in the background and thanks in particular for those who unmuted themselves and came online live and had a conversation. That worked well. We'll do more of that in the future. Bye for now.